it's something I've loved for a long time. Uh, and it's, you know, you go to a show and you see the singers sing and you hear the, you watch the players play and you just get lost in the show and it's something that, uh, you know, is, is deeply meaningful to me and hopefully a lot of you. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I grew up here in Ithaca and Ithaca has this fantastic music scene. So it has a number of really great venues like The Haunt, which has been a important stop on the sort of college town circuit for the last 45 years. Uh, Lot 10, which is a new, newer venue downtown, has two stages and often runs two simultaneous shows. The Nines, which has had this blues jam on Monday nights for like the, since the 70s, right? So, um, and finally, the State Theater, which brings larger, more well-established shows to Ithaca. Um, and, and that's really a great resource for our small community. We also have more music festivals than any other place I know. So the Ithaca Festival happens at the end of May, and they, they have about 130 local musicians playing both downtown on outdoor stages and at, uh, at Stewart Park on the lake. Uh, the Grassroots Festival of Music and Dance happens about 10 miles up the lake in Trumansburg. It's a four-stage, uh, it's a four-day, four-stage event. Um, and in high school, my buddies and I would get together and we'd plan out these elaborate tent cities that we'd construct in the middle of the infield there. And it was the perfect launching ground to go see as many sets as we could during those four days. Um, a, a recent addition to the festivals in Ithaca is Porchfest. And Porchfest is this incredible idea where people just get together on a lazy Sunday afternoon in the fall and just start playing music on their back porch. And it started in 2007, and it had about 30 bands. Uh, and then this year, there were 145 acts playing over a four-hour period. Um, it's also it's an idea that's been transplanted to 17 other cities in the country. So really great, uh, really great festivals. But what makes Ithaca particularly special is the depth of talent in terms of the artists, right? So we have a huge number of artists. I would, I would argue that we probably have more artists per capita than anywhere on the country. Um, some of the bands have been playing since I was in high school over 20 years ago, like the Sim Redmond Band, Donna the Buffalo, and John Brown's Body. But we also have this constant influx of new talent, like Jim Cotta and the Gun Poets and Casey's Second Dan. Uh, and which actually I didn't know she was emceeing until today, so, uh, so that is no joke. Uh, and so uh, we just, you know, we're very, we're very fortunate. Um, of course, I also play some music. This is, a, this is the album cover for my high school band. I think you can tell from the quality of the album artwork, we were destined for greatness. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I still play with some of these guys. We play at Porch Fest, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, we had a lot of fun playing shows at venues like The Haunt, at some of the music festivals, and we saved up all our money, and we recorded our, our demo CD in, in one weekend, uh, and it was a really great experience for me. So Ithaca is this fantastic place to experience live music. But then I went off to college in central Jersey, uh, and so, uh, and I found two problems there. The first is what I call the lowest common denominator of music appreciation. And so this is where all of my friends and, and classmates were listening to very generic mainstream stuff. Not, not necessarily bad stuff, but it was like Led Zeppelin or, or The Grateful Dead, and that's fine. I like those bands, but they would also listen to a lot of contemporary pop music, which at the time was like Britney Spears or the NSYNC Boys or whatever, and it was, it was, just, it was just awful. Um, that was, you know, uh, okay. So music is subjective and we all have our own favorites, but that's fine. Um, but so, and the, the second problem is it was just really hard to get off campus to explore the local music scene. And so I never really got into it in college, but I chalked it up to the fact that we're busy, uh, we have a lot of extracurricular activities, and um, you know, it's just hard to get off campus. But then I went and I lived in other cities. I went out and lived in San Francisco for a while, and then uh, San Diego for grad school, and, and back to Philadelphia. And these three cities all have great music scenes, they're, they're kind of but I never really got into them the same way I got into the music scene here in Ithaca when I was growing up. And this, this sort of bothered me a little bit because I did love going to see live shows. And at the same time, I was in grad school and I was studying computational music analysis, so using computers to analyze music. I was also uh, studying recommender systems. So a recommender system is something like uh, how Amazon recommends products to you or how uh, Netflix recommends movies to you. And so, this problem of not getting involved in the local music scene, as well as my, my knowledge of these uh, uh, sort of evolving technologies, um, led me to think about this, this issue at a, at a, you know, this music recommendation problem at a deeper level. 
So let's take a step back for a second and think about how we discover new music. And the single best way to discover music is to ask a friend. So this is my hipster buddy, Chris, actually a student in my lab. Uh, and he knows a lot about music, and he goes to a lot of shows. He's way hipper than I am. Uh, and uh, and he, he tells me about great shows, and he might drag me to a few shows. Uh, and, and that's the best way to learn about music. But when we move to a new city, we don't always have a Chris. And we don't have somebody who can tell us where to go and, and what to see. The other main way we learn about music uh, using traditional media is the sort of newspaper. So here's the Ithaca Times. It lists a bunch of, sh a bunch of shows. And there are, you know, the band name, which is unknown to me, and a short little description of what kind of genre those, those bands play. And so it's not really enough information to be able to say, I'm going to go spend two hours and five dollars checking out this band. But this is the 21st century. There's a lot of music technologies out there. Uh, the biggest three are, uh, the biggest three are iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And these are all what we call celestial jukeboxes, right? Because they give us on-demand access to music at the, 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 at the at a, you know, we can listen to any song whenever we want on any device we have, uh, and that's pretty powerful stuff. But with these jukeboxes, we tend to stick pretty close to the music that we already know. So it's not really that great of a model for discovering new music. There's also this new trend in sort of personalized radio, which um, involves, uh, you know, the examples are like Pandora or the new iTunes radio or Slacker, and the model here is a little better for music discovery. It involves creating a seed artist and then having people, and then having a computer algorithm generate a personalized stream of music so that the listener can then adapt that stream using thumbs up or thumbs down. And these are pretty popular, um, and this is something that we're going to explore in depth here. Um, but there's a problem with all of these mainstream systems. And the problem has to do with the fact that if we take all of the songs uh, in, in, a, in, the, in the world, and we rank them by how popular they are, there are, there's a small number of songs that receive the lion's share of attention. So, so this is sometimes called the 80-20 rule. And this says that 80% of the attention is uh, you know, taken by 20% of the items, and in this case, songs. So, but for music, if you look at the numbers, it's actually something more like 95% of the revenue is, uh, is taken by 2.5% of, of the songs. So we have this huge problem. This is sometimes referred to as the long tail problem. Um, and so if we're trying to recommend music, particularly music by local artists, they live way out here in the, in the long tail. So this is going to be a problem. This is going to prevent us from using the existing technologies that are out there. Although I should say there has been a few new, uh, new music technologies in the last couple of years. Bands in Town, Delhi Radio, and Jukli are three of them. They, they do focus on recommending local music, but they tend to be they tend to have pretty sparse coverage, particularly outside of the major metropolitan areas. Um, there are also a couple of great sites, uh, like Listen Local First in Washington, DC, uh, Austin Music Map, and Spindio. And these look at uh, specific uh, uh, urban centers, like Austin and, and Spindio's in New York City. Um, and they tell, they use a lot of human experts to create really immersive and excellent uh, user interfaces so that you can discover music if you're in one of those three cities. But all of these systems have, have a, a two other problems. The first is the problem that they present the information in a very overwhelming way. So this is what we sometimes call as active discovery. So what they do is they say, OK, here, and it's the same problem we had with the newspaper. So here they say, here's a, a website called Reverb Nation. And they sort of say, here's 10 artists you should definitely check out right now. And that can be overwhelming to users. There's actually a name for it. It's called the paradox of choice. And the paradox says that when given a user so many options, they become quickly overwhelmed, and they end up making no selections in the end. And they become dissatisfied with the system. There's, a, there's another problem, which is a little more subtle, which is the problem of familiarity. So we know from music psychology research that people like music that they've heard before. We, they like things that are familiar. And so, when you hear music by Bruno Mars or Pink or Mumford and Sons, you've already heard those songs a bunch of times uh, you know, on the radio, at a club, uh, in the grocery store, at the gym. And you've, you've, seen, um, you've heard their music before you sort of identified those songs with those individual artists. So when you, somebody says, check out this great song by Mumford and Sons, you've already heard it and you're, you're, you're sort of predisposed to liking it. So if I were to say to you, OK, here, listen to this song by Kevin Kinsella or the Sim Redmond Band or the Gun Poets, it's, chances are you're not going to really appreciate it right away. Now, you might like it uh, later, after you've heard it a couple times. 
Uh, but you won't like it if somebody's sort of force feeding it to you. So uh, here at Ithaca College, my students and colleagues and I have been working on a solution to this problem, the problem where we want to really recommend music by local artists, but we want to do it in this passive way where you sort of discover music uh, in, a, in a more natural setting. The system uh, we have is called Meg's Radio. It's this ad-free, not-for-profit uh, system that is personalized radio, and it focuses the user's attention on local music, right? So, so uh, it involves a lot of technical pieces. Uh, the first piece is web mining, and so this is scraping up information from the internet, uh, primarily about famous artists, because these local obscure artists tend not to have too much of what we call a digital footprint. So we use that uh, information we collect about the sort of mainstream popular artists to train a machine listening system. And the machine listening system does two things for us. It, it automatically generates labels for the music, so genres, emotions, uh, uh, instruments. It also allows us to compare songs, uh, two, pair, two songs to each other. So we can say that this song and this song are this similar. And this allows us to compare popular songs to these local obscure songs. Finally, we put all of this information together with some intelligent playlist algorithms, and that gives us our uh, personalized radio. So here's what it looks like. Um, we have a lot of features that are specifically used to make the, uh, to turn the listener's attention to local music. So you can start out by creating a station for uh, local Ithaca artists or for artists that will be playing shows in Ithaca in the coming months. We have featured stations like the State Theater of Ithaca station. Uh, pretty soon we'll have the Ithaca Festival 2014 station where I'm sure you'll be able to hear Second Dam. Uh, and you can also create your own station much more similar to the way that you would use something like Pandora. And so let's say we want to do that. I, I, I'm new to Ithaca. I don't know much about the local music scene, but I know that I like Pandora. Or sorry, sorry, excuse me. I know that I like Pearl Jam, because this is, you know, I'm from the 90s. Um, yeah, so that's Eddie Vedder doing his sort of grunge thing. Uh, and we have a lot of features that are not found in most commercial systems. So you can see all of your radio stations. Uh, you know, we, we create those other stations for you so that you can listen to them later if you like. Um, we also have a lot of ways you can control the blend of music that you hear. So we can go into the station preferences. And the very top uh, control you have is the ability to turn on that you want more local music, or maybe you want less local music, depending on your mood. Um, so we uh, can also create multiple influences to stations. So maybe I don't want per the grunge Pearl Jam. Maybe I want the sort of acoustic, mellow, uh, Eddie Vedder Pearl Jam. And so we would switch the influences, and then we'd get a song more like this. Yes, I understand that every life must be end. Uh -huh. Right, so now we've done something like develop trust between the users and our recommender system. And so they, they know that they can create influences and they're going to get appropriate music from the artists they, they know and love. Um, and we can, we can encourage them to add more influences, other tags, or maybe similar artists like Nirvana. Um, but then what we do is something a little bit different than you might experience at Pandora or iTunes Radio. We slip in music. Traveling man. We cross lines. So every couple of songs, we include a song by a local artist that is related to the music that, is, uh, it, that the user already knows. So maybe this song by Kevin Kinsella and T.T. Chicopee sounds a little bit like the acoustic Pearl Jam that I, as a listener, already uh, know. And the idea is that you're using this at work, or you're you know, playing it in the background at your house, and you passively discover these new songs. So they become familiar, and then maybe you notice that uh, they happen to be playing at Agava, uh, unfortunately, last night, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and so you missed it, but I'm sure Kevin will be playing again soon. Uh, and, and you might decide to go see that uh, show. Uh, you can also uh, explore events in a more active manner. We have this interactive map feature, which ties your listening experience to your, uh, to your interest in going to see live shows. So uh, for example, uh, we, we recommend events based on the music you've listened to and the music you've liked. So maybe because you've, li you've listened to MGMT, you should go see, who's similar to Jim Cotta, you should go see Jim Cotta at the Haunt next week. And that's the idea. So we, we recommend music in a passive way, but then you can be active about finding events that you might want to go see. So like I said, this has been a labor of love for the last four years since I started here at Ithaca College. 
Um, I've had a number of really talented students, both in uh, you know, design and, and UI, uh, user interface and user experience, as well as students who are more technical and have a sort of computer science background. I have also have a number of collaborators, like Adam Peruta, who talked earlier this morning, um, and Brian DeZoritz, who does music here in the Whalen School. Um, and this is, a, this is a, an ongoing and emerging and growing uh, project. Uh, it's also, I should say, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, so they sort of believe in the value of this work, too, I, I hope. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we launched the system back at, ahead of PorchFest last September. We had about 1,500 people use it in the first three or four weeks, um, which was exciting. But we also learned that people don't listen to music on their computers anymore. Again, I'm old. Um, so young people listen to music on their phones. So we've been working on a mobile device recently. Um, we're also coming out with a companion site that artists can use to upload music and tell us about events, but also see how people are listening to their music. So these are all very exciting things that we're going to be working on in the near future. Um, but Meg's Radio is really a means to an end. The, the goal is not to have you listen to Meg's Radio, per se, but to really go out and explore local music. Right? So mu these, there are these extremely talented musicians all around us. And we want to help them be discovered. We really want to contextualize their music with music by more famous artists uh, that we've, we are more familiar with and show you that they have, they're as talented, if not maybe more talented in some cases, and that you can go see these artists and you can support them for you know, 10 or 20 10 or $15 at a local venue. And that helps the local economy grow. And there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to use this sort of this, this small scale local music recommendation system instead of, instead of maybe uh, one of the more mainstream systems like Pandora or iTunes. So go see live music. It's, it's good for your soul. Thank you.